so we should go ahead and start. So I'll turn Hi, it to our moderator. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> go ahead, Julia. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we are joined by Senator Favola, the host of today's virtual town hall, Delegate Sullivan, Delegate Hope, and also uh, the Chief Workforce Advisor to the Governor, Megan Healy. Senator, do you want to kick things off? Sure. Uh, well, thank you all for, for joining. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to our uh, participants. We'll try to make this an interesting and lively discussion. Uh, we certainly have a lot of uh, topics to talk about. I'll just take a moment and maybe bring you up to speed a little bit on uh, the governor's COVID-19 um, executive orders. Most of you probably have heard that um, I guess as of midnight, uh, when we hit that magical May 15th, um, parts of Virginia, other than Northern Virginia at this point, um, the, nearly the rest of Virginia will be in a phase one opening, which means restaurants will be open if they have outdoor seating and they'll be at 50% capacity and the restaurant employees will be required to wear masks. Now the patrons will be encouraged to wear masks, um, but it's not a stated requirement in the executive order. The governor has made it clear that these are minimal requirements. So if jurisdictions want to implement uh, more aggressive uh, public health practices, they could certainly do that. And, and I'm sure some restaurant patrons may actually post signs saying we expect patrons, if at all possible, if uh, to, to you know, wear a mask. Social distancing will also be required at these restaurants. So folks will be expected to be six feet apart. Um, so that's the, the latest um, news. Northern Virginia, every uh, jurisdiction within Northern Virginia actually um, signed on to a letter. It was organized by the Northern Virginia Regional Commission. It's a body I used to chair many, many years ago. Um, so that commission sent a letter to the governor uh, articulating some facts that were are still um, uh, challenging us in, in NOVA. Um, you know, we're, in, we're seeing continually increases in our identified COVID-19 cases. Our hospitalization rate is much higher than the rest of the state. We're about at 27% of our identified cases are hospitalized and the state average is 17%. Um, so we, I think with good reason, our local leaders uh, did the right thing, asking the governor to, uh, to allow a delay in uh, NOVA. And I think that delay goes to May 29th. And then there'll be a reassessment. It's not an automatic, yes, you're going to open on May 29th. We still have to meet certain criteria. Um, the two weeks, we, we are expecting two weeks of, of, you know, reductions in the number of COVID cases identified in the reductions in hospitalizations. So that's the general uh, backdrop of where we are. Uh, just moving a little bit to our 2020 session, it was a successful session. It seems like it was years ago, but it was really just... Well, eight, nine weeks ago that I was driving home from Richmond. It, it seems like it's been a, a century. We, um, you know, it was a transformational by any count. You know, we passed really great legislation on um, worker protection, on moving the minimum wage forward over a three-year period gradually, but, but moving it forward. Um, you know, we made great headway and with uh, the Clean Economy Act, and my colleague Rip Sullivan was a chief patron of that bill in the House. Um, and I know, uh, I'm sure Delegate Hope and myself and others worked very hard to get it passed as well, but we appreciate your leadership, um, Rip. Um, I myself focused a lot on health care bills. Um, I did get a no surprise medical billing uh, bill through, which was a surprise to everybody. So if you go to a doctor or a hospital that's out of network, you are not gonna be uh, stuck with a surprise bill. So that's, that was a really good thing. Um, 
And then, of course, in the Senate, I shepherd a bill that uh, Delegate Ho put through, actually a very common sense bill, which merely stated any CDC recommended vaccine would automatically become part of the state recommended vaccine list. And therefore, the state could purchase the vaccines in bulk and distribute them to our local health departments. We had such a conversation on that. It was uh, surprising that it didn't just pass uh, simply and uh, automatically, but it, it did not. We, uh, the anti-vacciners were out in force that day. Uh, of course, we, did, we all did a great job on um, gun safety issues. And I know Delegate Hope, many of those bills went through your committee. Um, so I was very happy with the, the bill. I was the chief co-patron on giving local uh, governments authority to regulate firearms in public buildings and public spaces. And of course, there were some other really marquee bills like the um, red flag bill, which I think you patroned, uh, Delegate um, Sullivan. So that was sort of a big overview. Well, we're happy to take questions, but I think my colleagues might want to also talk about their great session. And lastly, I will just say, you can thank me as chair of rehab and social services. I spent a lot of time working with uh, ABC and figuring out how to um, allow <laughs> restaurants to uh, more easily sell alcoholic beverages as, as a way to help our restaurants. and. Uh, and has a way to serve our constituents. So uh, I'm finished for the moment. Thank you. Uh, a delegate I, I, hope. Yeah, thank you, Julia. Uh, and, and thank you, Megan. We're so happy that you're here. Probably a lot of questions and people want to get to them about uh, what the future holds for the Commonwealth and to, to get us back on track. Uh, it's great to be with you, Senator. It's great with, to be with you, Delegate, Mr. Chair. Uh, this was a very historic session, and, and I think we all left the session uh, really, really pleased with all that we accomplished because we did do a, a, a great deal. Um, but, you know, we didn't realize what was before us with, with the uh, COVID-19 and, and what that would do to our economy. And boy, it, it, it's, it's tanked pretty quickly. And, and I think that we're all trying to get into the recovery mode and, and doing the best that we can to help one another. Um, I like what the governor says is, is that, you know, we have two problems. We have a health care crisis and we have an economic one. And we can't get to the economic one until we deal with the health care one. And a lot of different things have, have percolated and bubbled up um, that, were, uh, that we tried to deal with during the session that look all that more important to deal with now. And I think about voting rights and I think about the good work that Senator Favola did on, on sick leave. Uh, the stuff that we did with immunizations on, on my bill, you know, a, a lot of things that, that if we, when we do go back into special session, we're going to have to take a, another look at. Uh, but uh, given that the, the, the serious crisis that our budget is in and, and coming back in a special session and trying to patch up and fill that gap, I hope that we can uh, craft a new budget that redirects a lot of those priorities towards people who need it the most and be as helpful as we can. But uh, there's just a long litany, a long list of things that I think had a lot of pent up demand for, yeah. for all of us here on this call, priorities that uh, for our values uh, that, that we cherish so much and have pushed for, for years. Uh, a remarkable accomplishments in, in, in the, in the uh, environmental space that, that Delegate Sullivan championed, a lot of uh, victories in gun safety reform, yeah. uh, minimum wage increase, uh, criminal justice reform, working towards legalization of marijuana. Uh, we move towards moving it, make it decriminalizing it. Um, but still a lot of work that we have to do. And even though we're, we're in this unprecedented times, there's still a great deal that we can still be proud of and, and help people get back on their feet. And so I look forward to the questions. I want to thank Senator Favola for, for hosting today and, and, and bringing uh, this great group here. Um, and I really do look forward to your questions. So thank you all for having me. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. Delegate Sullivan. Thank you, Julia. Uh, like Patrick, Barbara, I, I thank you for, for putting this together. Uh, and I can't see all the folks out in the audience, but thank you all for, for being here. You know, this is, this is the time of year when uh, Barbara and Patrick and I and other members of the General Assembly are doing a lot of these sorts of events live. Yeah. Um, 
yeah. uh, reporting on the General Assembly session and uh, what happened, what our successes were, what our uh, failures were. Um, uh, and I, frankly, of course, I'm happy to do that this evening. You've heard a lot from uh, uh, Barbara and Patrick about really some of the um, spectacular accomplishments um, that we had this, this year. <clears throat> but um, it does seem a very, very long time ago. And um, I think tonight's probably going to be mostly about uh, what's happened over the course of the last nine weeks. I hope everyone out there is, uh, is staying safe, um, following, following guidelines. You know, it's interesting. We've had, over the course of the last uh, you know, several weeks, as we've been <clears throat> starting to talk about reopening, we've had parts of the state who've been um, uh, complaining that they were uh, shut down at all or wanted, wanted to be allowed to reopen early. Um, uh, interesting, I don't know, it's not ironic, it's, it's remarkable in some way that, that uh, the jurisdictions in the northern part of Virginia recently actually asked to stay closed. Uh, and frankly, there are still a couple of other jurisdictions, which I think we're going to hear from the governor about tomorrow, in other parts of the yep. state, Richmond, Accomack yep. County, yep. who've also asked to stay closed, yep. um, which to me just shows uh, how seriously people are taking this. Uh, and um, despite the fact that our numbers aren't where, yet where we want them to be, we all know what we have to do to get them to where we want them to be. I was just talking to my wife, Beth, who was watching, I don't know if it was Anderson or Wolf or somebody, but they were showing pictures of um, at least one particular bar out in Wisconsin. Wisconsin has opened. Yes. It uh, and it looked yeah. like Clarendon on a Friday night. Um, and that's really worrisome. Uh, this notion of this pent up, yeah. uh, you know, people have been pent up for so long. And yes, there are going to be lots of rules about what you can and can't do or should or shouldn't do. But you do, you do, at least I worry a lot about um, people uh, not being as careful as they should. So I, I see it as part of my role, and I bet my colleagues do as well, uh, is to continue to remind people of how, of how uh, important it is. Mm -hmm. um, I've probably touched my face three times since I got on here. The problem with these things is you can see yourself and it reminds you how often you touch your face. Um, don't touch your face, wash your hands, all that sort of thing. <laughs> um, I recently was asked to, uh, to make some comments at a graduation. I, a, kid who's, a kid who's graduated from college and I was asked for some wisdom. And I'm not sure there's any wisdom beyond these days. Wash your hands, right? That's the most important piece of wisdom you can give anybody. Um, so I'm glad to hear, uh, I was glad that, that uh, the Northern Virginia um, leadership asked to wait. We'll tell you, uh, there are a lot of people disappointed by that. Of course, certainly businesses are desperate to get back open, but uh, I have not heard a hue and cry. Um, I'm sure there's some people that do disagree with the decision, but my sense is that most of Northern Virginians get it and realize that we need a little bit more time up here in Northern Virginia. Um, so I'm, I, you've heard a lot already. Uh, I'm going to stop talking. Uh, I'm happy to take your question. I look forward to your questions. I wonder if I might exercise uh, the prerogative of going last and, 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 and introduce Megan Healy um, and ask her the first question. Um, we are really, really lucky to have uh, Megan Healy with us this evening, who is a member of the governor's cabinet. If you watch the governor's press conferences, you see her with great regularity. Um, uh, it, has been, uh, it has been Megan's uh, unfortunate duty to, she sort of landed at the bottom of this avalanche of 500,000 unemployed Virginians, all of whom have been trying to get on the, the website. I'm sure maybe you can tell us some stories about that experience. Um, uh, but she's been, been doing a terrific job under, under extraordinarily difficult circumstances. And Megan, let me just ask you a question, and you have to answer it right away. You may have some introductory remarks. But one thing I have heard a lot about from constituents is when we when we do get to quote reopen in phase one, um, there is a, a real concern among among folks who will be who will be asked to go back to work uh, that they may not feel safe going back to work. Uh, one constituent called me who, who uh, uh, is a dental hygienist, and she was being asked to go and start putting her hands in people's mouths. Um, and the concern, of course, is. What if I don't feel safe? What if I don't go back? What's going to happen to my unemployment? I know there's been some back and forth between us and the federal government on that, with the feds taking a harder line than, than, than we, Virginia, would like them to take. So in your remarks, if you could sort of talk to some of the folks out there uh, in our audience who might be concerned 
about when they do get the, the, the green light or the invitation or the direction to come back to work. Um, what do they do if they don't feel comfortable? Great. Well, thanks everyone for having me on this uh, call tonight. It's an, it's great to be Senator Favola, Delegate Sullivan, and Delegate Hope. They're true champions of workforce and workers, and that's what I ever see. Uh, I saw all of them in committee presenting the bills for workers to support. And they they've been fantastic to work with. I know every day they're they're thinking about better ways to to support workers or making sure that Virginians have those opportunities to get the skills to fill the jobs. Especially the there's a lot of jobs open norm Virginia there was before and then we're still looking at what the economic future looks like to make sure that some people might not have jobs after this crisis and we want to make sure they get the skills uh, to, to get those jobs. So I really I really thank you for that. As a chief workforce development advisor, um, I really do about workforce and that's working with education institutions to make sure everyone has the skills as well as work with the career work centers. We have 61 of those uh, to give everyone that chance to connect them to those jobs. Uh, during this COVID-19 challenge and crisis, uh, the governor's tasked me with really looking at workers and worker safety, very closely what Delegate Sullivan asked me about, and I'll talk a little about that, as well as uh, the Virginia Employment Commission is, is tucked under me as an agency, and that we've received over half a million. It's actually, we got new numbers today, over 675,000 Virginians that are now filed a claim for unemployment. Um, so we have been working through that system. I know it's been challenging and I know people want their benefits. Um, we've never had, again, an example in February, we had 2.6% unemployment rate. It's one of the lowest in history. We had more Virginians working than ever in Virginia history. Um, and we had, we were caught with half the staff we had during the recession. We had 1,600 workers during the recession. And that was at a 9% unemployment rate. Our unemployment rate will come out next week, but the national unemployment rate is 14.6%. Um, so we're, we're above the, the, what the recession was. And again, that was kind of a long, long runway to, to people being employed. This was matters of weeks that we had this many people file for unemployment. Also, the federal government has expanded eligibility. And so with the CARES Act, that um, anyone on unemployment receives an extra $600 to the end of July. Um, the, the benefits will extend past 26 weeks to 39 weeks. And what is brand new to Virginia, brand new is the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. And this is specifically for independent contractors, gig workers, sole proprietors. This is a, a group of workers who've never actually qualified for unemployment insurance and so we had to build a whole brand new system within two weeks to make sure that we can get the benefits as fast as we can out out to the Virginians and, and that it, it was a lot of work and we were the first top 10 states to get this moving um, there's still some states that actually still do not have the technology for for this extra eligibility and then also it's really working with workplace safety because we received thousands of complaints through our Virginia Occupational Safety and Health Office, which is through the Department of Labor and Industry. Uh, that agency is um, where there's 28 states that conform to federal OSHA. You've probably heard of OSHA laws that we're a conformity state. And when you conform to OSHA, they pay for 50% of your office expenses. So we're, we're closely tied uh, to the federal OSHA. So one of the things I'm going to talk about workplace safety in general is that we can only uh, enforce standards, since we're a conformity state standards that federal OSHA sends down. And we currently do not have standards uh, around COVID-19 infectious disease uh, specific to this. And we've been asking for these particular standards. And so when we look at enforcement of employers that might not be doing the right thing or that workers are unsafe um, situations, we do take every complaint seriously through our office but it's very hard to enforce. And usually we can enforce through citations and fines as well as we can do closure of business if we have those standards. So that has been one of the challenges. But also another challenge is that when we reopen Virginia, uh, many of the Virginians will be called back to work. And if they are unsafe uh, or feel unsafe, it's them themselves because of their health or they have a family member they have to go home to every night or they have elderly parents that might be susceptible to COVID-19 um, that they're scared to work. So we are getting thousands of, of questions of that, especially when we're gonna open up next week. Uh, the US uh, Department of Labor, again, uh, is what regulates our unemployment insurance. We have a little flexibility in how we run our program. 
um, and that's really with the unemployment insurance tax and what we can do. But uh, the current guidance that we received from U.S. Department of Labor is that if somebody is called back to work and they do not go, that they will be cut from the unemployment insurance benefit. And so what we are looking at is what if we, we will have to, to cut people, but we're really ramping up a better appeals and adjudication process. So if you have those, they're called good cause reasons that you cannot go to work safely, then you will have to go through this appeals process. And we are hiring people, about 45 people just to work on this process because we know it's gonna be a challenge. Um, to it and we've not set those guidelines of what those good cause reasons are uh, but we were working on it because we really know there's a huge concern with our workers and, and i'd be scared in some of these situations as, as as well in the reports that we have about employers that i read these reports and complaints all the time uh, so these are valid concerns we want to make sure we take every concern very seriously thank you for that um I want to just jump right in because we have a number of questions here that are coming in live as well. And one person asks, only a fraction of jobless Virginians have applied for unemployment benefits. And in Virginia, eligibility for, for benefits has been made more onerous and some jobless workers find the application process mystifying. Um, is there any consideration that the General Assembly might initiate a special commission to provide recommendations for unemployment insurance reform? And I think anyone might be able to take this question. Um, I, think, I, I think Megan should answer the first part about the immediate need and the onerous uh, application. I was under the impression from earlier press conferences, I think Megan, you participated in, which you said you have streamlined the application and tried to remove a lot of the hoops that were once there, like having to apply every week to get the unemployment insurance. Some of those hoops have been removed. So I'll let you go ahead and answer that. And then we can, we can comment on whether, uh, you know, an unemployment insurance commission should be established. Yes, um, so that's a fantastic question. Um, with, this, uh, with this crisis, we've done many, many things to make sure that this process can be easier for our Virginians. Um, we have cut certain pages. And so again, I wanna say that unemployment insurance is really regulated by the federal government. And it, it, it would probably look different, and I would say better if the General Assembly <laughs> ran our insurance uh, program. But since uh, we align to the federal government, we have to follow their rules. And if we step over that line and do not conform to their rules, we get actually a 90% tax cut to our businesses that fill the unemployment insurance trust. And so I will say that they do hold that over your head. They say, if you don't conform to our laws or you don't follow what we tell you to do, then you're not gonna get your 90% tax cut, which would be devastating. It's four, I think four or $500 million that the businesses would have to pay back into the UI trust. Um, that we get that particular cut. So that, that, that's kind of what one of the things we're always wary about um, with, with unemployment insurance programs. So what we've done is, it's a lot of government talk. I know that the application is, is weird and has weird language and a lot of people struggle to what does this really mean? We have, it used to be a lot longer the application. We have cut a lot of questions. We've tried to make streamline the boxes that you check lack of work and you should pretty much go to the page that says, Here's your, where's your bank account? And most of those folks can get benefits in one week. We had to add the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, which is a little bit more complicated because that's uh, the workers, independent contractors, gig workers, that this about 20% of workers are not in, in our regular unemployment system would have to file the additional application. And that's because those are the populations that usually do not get any type of unemployment. So that also causes um, additional headaches I know for, for our workers who are really just struggling and trying to get their benefits. Um, we have ramped up. We, have, we also cannot hire third party call centers until a couple weeks ago. So we're actually have a contract with 300 call center workers. We are signing another contract uh, this week for additional 300. And I know a lot of people have been struggling getting through our call center. Uh, we do have a callback, but we also have had problems when we take capacity, which is about 3,000 callers that it does sound like it hangs up on you, uh, which is another challenge. And we've also expanded three other, our, our base call centers in Grundy, South Boston, and expanding our Hanson call center. So we're trying to, to ramp up again. We had 1,600 people during the recession, 
in February around 800 workers. And so we're trying to ramp up as fast as possible to make sure that we can get the benefits out the door to the Virginians who need it the most. I, I don't think it's a bad idea to set up a, uh, a bipartisan commission to look at how the unemployment insurance compensation system works. We just have to keep in mind that there may be some areas the state would have control over, but there would be many areas that the federal government would have control over. And we could come up with recommendations and, and sort of funnel them to, you know, the appropriate levels of government. But it's, uh, it, I'm sure it's, it's a good idea, given this crisis that we're in. I'd like to not have to repeat <laughs> some of the things that we had to fix this time around. Megan, uh, uh, I've been looking at the chat room here and uh, some guy named Nagurka, a good and valued constituent, asked a question that I know you uh, uh, talk about a lot. Um, you're, you're focused, I know, right now on getting through this crisis, but I know you're already turning toward thinking about what, what happens next. Um, and in terms of folks who are out of work or looking to get new job skills or, or upskill, uh, community colleges play a huge role in that. And I'm wondering if you can comment just a little bit on how you think community colleges or other post-secondary opportunities are going to help us get out of this. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So interesting, if you look at the new jobs that came after the recession, 99% of them needed some type of post-secondary credential. So high school is no longer the finish line. And I think if you look what jobs are still stable, people are still working, they never this crisis did not disrupt um, their job. And if you look at who's currently on unemployment, it, you can actually see that we're, we're seeing anyone who has some type of college credential are, are more stable in this environment, as well as um, healthcare, which is probably the community college's largest uh, degree. I know thanks to you guys for supported um, the governor's G3 Get Skilled Give Back, um, Get a Job Give Back program. And we know that that with um, uh, tuition free plus extra wraparound supports for low and middle income students, um, 12,000 of those students would have been going into healthcare. And again, that's on pause, but uh, we've actually, uh, since the, the state budget's on pause, we've been working with our congressional delegation for them to pay for our G3 program. And that you see in the HEROES Act, there's some workforce and higher ed dollars. I, th I think it's important. I think some people, they've had this life pause they're at home, they're, they're questioning their careers. And I think some want to come back and say, you know what, I, I'm ready for a career switch, a career train change, and the community colleges are, are ready. Uh, they are launching online courses. They act, they, the, most students, about 75,000 community college students do online courses. A lot of people don't know that, you know, you think of your other institutions, but they do a fantastic job, especially in Northern Virginia, because Northern Virginia Community College is a leader in all things from cloud computing, cybersecurity that everyone can do online. And those are jobs when people are teleworking, cybersecurity, uh, cloud computing, those are the jobs uh, that are very stable and only growing. Um, so I, I would be excited. I can't wait to start talking about this pathways and getting people back in their job. <laughs> it seems far away, but it'll be here hopefully before we know it. That's what I'm hoping. Uh, what's next, Julia? Um, so switching gears a little bit, we have gotten a lot of questions about um, home health care workers. So one person says, I'm a home health care worker caring for older adults and people with disabilities on Medicaid, and I haven't been given any PPE, paid leave, or hazard pay. What is Virginia doing to support home health care workers like me and the people I care for? Well, in the General Assembly budget, the budget we just passed and that was reaffirmed in our veto session, home care workers will still get a 5% uh, wage increase. So that's really important. Um, but the whole area of not having PPE um, and not having some of the other worker protections uh, is problematic. And I know the state is uh, taking some steps to work with our home care agencies and to encourage them to really uh, arm the home care workers who are going into people's homes and the folks who are, you know, very vulnerable and um, in many cases medically challenged. Um, so it's, it's, it's not a good situation all around. It's not ideal for the 
for the patient in the home. It's not ideal for the worker. And, um, and I'm hoping that Megan can tell us the administration's doing a lot more than I would have expected. I, uh, I just want to note that there, the governor did submit a Medicaid waiver um, that will cover a range of issues that include worker training, uh, worker um, protections under the, the COVID-19 situation, and, um, and maybe some other innovations that the state may want to move forward. So, so to, the, to the constituent out there, we hear you and we feel for you. Uh, we want very much to help our home care workers. Yeah, I, I call. Yep. So I'll get. You go. Well, I, well, I was just going to say. I mean, this, this, if anything, this crisis has exposed a blind spot for Virginia for a number of years, and no one administration or anything like that is 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 uh, is, is to blame for it. We we we've underpaid our our home care workers, our nursing home, our assisted living facilities, and and you really look at this. A pandemic and the spread of it. Over half of the outbreaks are happening in these congregate living facilities, yeah. and and you've got people that are that are so underpaid going into these working nursing homes or assisted living. They they go to another assisted living facility, and we're not protecting them the way that we should. And and you know a lot of this caught us off guard. We've got to do a better job of getting the PPP and E into those congregate living facilities because that's where the spread is and. And the governor has done a very good job in, in, in trying to refocus efforts on those facilities. And, and we need to make sure that you have everything that you need. And, and again, it, it has shone a spotlight on yeah. not, not just the pay, but also the benefits as well, too. And I know Senator Favola was working really hard My on paid sick, sick leave. Day. On, you know, on paid sick day. I mean, that, that's something that I would hope that when we come back for a special session, Maybe that's something that we could take a look at because it's directly related to this crisis. Um, but it really has exposed a lot of different things that yeah. we need to work on. And so when we come back and take a look at our budget, it's an opportunity for us to refocus our efforts and, and try to uh, increase some reimbursement. I do know that the governor was able to increase, I think it was a 20% increase, I thought, in reimbursement to nursing homes. For nursing homes, yes. That I, is so. And so, uh, and so I hope that's a permanent thing. I don't know if it is or not, but, but I think it's something that we need to work very hard at the continuum of care. Nursing home, assisted living, group home, home care workers have got to be a focus for us in the future. And, and one other thing I just want to note, the governor did announce uh, earlier this week that we will have um, comprehensive testing in our nursing homes and our long-term care facilities. Um, so every resident as well as every worker. So that's really needed uh, if we're to contain this. And as you mentioned, Delegate Hope, it is a vulnerable population. So uh, I was glad to hear that we were moving forward on that. Let me just add one thing. Um, Patrick mentioned the special session. We, we, we know we're going back to Richmond uh, at some point uh, to deal with with, with budget issues. Uh, and what I want folks to understand is what, what has essentially happened is that next year's budget um, has sort of been put on hold until we get a better feel for what, uh, how, how big a hole this has blown in, in our budget. But apropos of our comments earlier about what a successful session we had, we passed a budget um, that really reflected uh, some important changes and, 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 and a lot of good democratic progressive values, including, as, as Patrick pointed out, you know, raises for home health care workers and, and, and leave issues and things like that. And so those priorities aren't going to change. That budget's still in place in the sense of where we think things are important. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, what we're going to have to do is make some really hard decisions about not, so ne not so necessarily what gets cut, but how much gets cut or what gets delayed. Yeah. Um, we're just going to have to refigure that budget. But, but I, I think what you saw this year, part of that historic session we've talked about, was um, a reprioritizing out of the new majority uh, uh, in both houses uh, of where our priorities want to be. That's where they're going to remain, albeit unfortunately at, at lower amounts of money for the foreseeable future. And I just want to add one more thing to, to 
I'm so glad that you brought up um, home health care workers and long-term care care workers. I am the chair, the, the, the governor has, uh, Dr. Lori Falano has long-term care COVID-19 strike force or a task force, and I do chair the staffing um, of that long-term care because I got a call on Saturday that we had no workers actually show up to a long-term care as a rehab facility, um, and I had to right away, I, I also, um, help kind of oversee the medic reserve course. So those are our volunteers that have medical training and we try to put them in in emergency situations. And then we work with staff and companies, health systems and local, even we're trying to recruit nursing students that just graduated, especially from the community college to, to backfill some of these jobs. But the disparity in the wages, um, when they're working with residents that are sick and scared, and many of those residents can communicate about what their needs are and then we're not letting family in there to be advocates uh, for many of these residents in long-term care, staffing is, is a must. And so we have put in budget requests, the, the state has received the $1.8 billion uh, for the COVID-19 response. And we've put in requests for home health care workers, uh, very exactly what you said, the pay is sickly, the hazard pay is with that uh, Medicaid waiver, which has not been, there hasn't been a state's been approved for that yet. Uh, so we put that in there, but I just say that these heroes that are, are working on the front line in those long-term care facilities or with uh, residents as home health care, uh, they're doing amazing work. And, and in the end, I mean, we just need to pay them more. No, yeah, absolutely. We treat them better. Treat them with the dignity that they really deserve. So we stand- and that, they treat, and that they treat our loved ones with. Yes. Um, we have another question here, the CARES Act offers incentives for states like Virginia that currently do not have short-term compensation to provide additional help to employers and workers in the Commonwealth during this emergency. Will Virginia enact a permanent short-term compensation law? We will not be able to enact something uh, until the 2021 session. That would not be, um, I don't believe that will fall within the framework of what our special session might cover, although I'm not 100% sure. The governor calls a special session and defines what topics will be um, discussed, or, or <laughs> the House and Senate um, can also shape what topics will be discussed. So I, I can't say for sure that we'll be able to get to that uh, immediately in our our special session coming up, I think it's probably gonna be late August, early September. But I know that there have been bills put in that will allow for job sharing. And um, that's a concept which is very much part of that short-term compensation. We are very sensitive to the fact that employers don't necessarily wanna lay people off and we don't want people laid off. So a way to avoid that maybe is to do a part-time employment or job sharing or keep the person on the payroll for you know, three weeks out of the month and then you know, furlough them for one week a month. We get that and we need to figure out how to make it work more smoothly in Virginia. With that segue, I will uh, turn it over to Ms. Healy, Dr. Healy. <laughs> um, that's actually an excellent question with the short-term compensation of the CARES Act. There was $100 million for states to, to implement a new program or to, um, to, to better their, their system as well as they would get 100% reimbursable for the, the work share. Um, I will say that we amended a bill. Uh, the governor sent to you amended that added a little bit more flexible language in our UI. It was a technical UI bill, so it was very wonky, but uh, the amendment that went down was around work share. So just a couple sentences that just gave us some flexibility if we wanted to move towards this program since and it had an accident in there. So the government's going to pay for this work share or short-term compensation plan that Virginia can move forward. And so we are still looking at that. We have not, again, our employment commission is a little busy these days, um, but we are working on what that might look like. So we did add a couple, uh, some lines in there, just some flexibility. So we can move forward potentially with that um, short-term compensation plan, uh, but we're not there yet. But uh, hold tight, hopefully soon. Um, our next question is about um, the upcoming school year. 
So how is the governor's office taking into account data and factors beyond the virus information uh, into planning for the next school year? And how should parents provide feedback and input into that decision? Um, I haven't, I actually researched that question because it has come to me by several constituents prior to advertising the, um, uh, what we're doing now, <laughs> the Zoom meeting we're doing now. But um, Dr. Lane, who is the state superintendent for education, has established a task force, and he's calling it a recovery and return to school task force, working with superintendents and other stakeholders around the state to try to develop a, a map for how school systems can ease back into uh, some kind of instruction that may be partially on site, may be partially offline or, or maybe continue to be offline, but there has to be some pathway forward. And I know superintendents, some superintendents are really concerned about our children falling behind. Um, you know, again, almost depending on your zip code, some some kids are doing quite well with the online learning and parents are supervising it and the children are not falling behind, but there are other pockets where our children are falling behind. They either don't have access to the internet, um, they don't have an actual computer in their home or for whatever reason, and the online uh, lessons are just not um, being accessed. So, so we have to come up with a way which ensures every child will be able to succeed. And I don't know what that's going to look like because I'm not sure where we will be in this COVID-19 um, crisis when it comes to the fall, but we do have a task force working on it. I Thank you, it. Senator. Um, I think you're muted. Okay. Um, our next question is about clean energy jobs. So not COVID-19 related, but um, relevant nonetheless. Various recent studies have concluded that clean energy jobs, such as renewable energy, high value energy efficiency, energy storage, will add anywhere from 62,000 to 131,000 Virginia jobs. Um, so the question is, can we leverage this success to immediately attract private capital specifically into the state's critical infrastructure? Julia, let me, let me take a shot at least starting the conversation. Uh, I, I think the answer is, quick answer is yes. Um, Senator McClellan and I, uh, Senator McClellan, uh, patron of the, the VCA in the Senate, uh, actually did an op-ed uh, in the uh, Richmond Times Dispatch a week or so ago, sort of on this topic. Um, and you know, in, in our view, uh, the VCA was a good idea when we passed it. It may even be a better idea now for precisely the kinds of reasons that the, that the questioner uh, quoted. Um, uh, there's just no question that uh, clean energy, energy efficiency um, are real great job creators. And they tend to be small businesses, you know, putting solar panels on on roofs or working on energy efficiency in, in homes and buildings. Um, and that's where, uh, you know, our small businesses need to rehire people, need to get people to work, are the drivers of the, of the economy. Um, and there are lots of studies out there about what, what can produce how many jobs. We were talking about the VCA uh, producing 13,000 jobs a year. Um, so, uh, you know, every politician thinks their bill is a jobs bill, right? Well, the VCA really is a jobs bill on top of all the other uh, great effects it's going to have on our uh, on combating uh, climate change. Um, so it does come at a really, I think, propitious moment uh, where when what we need to do is think about ways to get people back to work on the back end of this, um, you know, with a plan in place that's going to be um, mandating and incentivizing uh, uh, a move to clean, to clean energy. Uh, I'd like to think, um, I know Senator McClellan likes to think, and I think a lot of folks who, who uh, helped us get the VCA through like to think that it's going to be a way to help create more jobs in Virginia, be a part of, among other things, be a part of getting us out of this mess we're in. I, I would just add that uh, under the bill that um, 
uh, Delegate Sullivan just talked about, our Clean Economy Act, um, Dominion has to meet some pretty uh, aggressive targets um, to get to renewable energy, uh, actually completely by uh, 2045. And um, so they might be a good partner in, in terms of um, being willing to, to maybe fund or um, provide seed money for some renewable energy projects, which they would, they have to move to if they're going to maintain their uh, dominance in Virginia, they're going to have to meet some public policy goals. So uh, hopefully, um, Hopefully they might they might be able to bring some money to the table and maybe we can get some federal money, not directly related to COVID-19, but there may be another federal stimulus package somewhere down the road where we could use money to achieve some of these goals. I think that depends on who you're talking to up on Capitol Hill. It does. Yeah, it does. We might not even get, you know, this this, you know. CARES Act 5 is or this is the, the fifth stimulus package, which has money for state and local governments. That's being debated. <laughs> the value of giving money to state and local governments in the middle of an emergency. I, it's amazing to me that would be debated, but it's okay. Our next question. Yeah, I just want to add, oh, I was going to just one more thing. Uh, you know, I think it's a really important to grow this sector. But in the economic development world, when we were recruiting new businesses to Virginia, they actually want um, carbon-free energy. So the example is our largest uh, energy is AWS. In Virginia, they actually acquired Dominion's one of the largest customers because of the energy. But they're also working with us to put solar parks around the state right. to make sure. Um, and so when we have the Googles and uh, Facebook and all those data centers that do use a lot of energy, they're looking for other ways uh, with lots of different solar parks that they're so supporting around the state to make sure that, that you know, they're um, being environmentally safe. And, and that actually is like two, two fold jobs, right? Because we have people putting the solar panels up uh, or the offshore wind turbines, but then we also have business because we recruit to Virginia because we have um, that, that green environment. Um, we got a question about mandating and enforcing the wearing of masks to protect the high risk population. Uh, you know, the governor has has been asked many, many times whether he's going to mandate masks and his answer uh, is consistently no. He's uh, um, uh, uh, he suggests it, he urges it, he cajoles it. Um, but uh, I think he's made the decision uh, not to mandate it. Megan, you may have been in some of these meetings and I don't know what you're allowed to tell us, but uh, that is the decision that, that he's made so far. I think um, actually in my early comments, I was talking about how um, you know, my observation, at least in my neck of the woods, um, folks are following these rules because they recognize that uh, wearing a mask is frankly the socially responsible thing to do. You are protecting other people when you're wearing a mask, um, not yourself. Um, there's, maybe there's did I get the wrong about the governor's position on this? Nope, you're exactly right. There's, there's also some uh, thinking that maybe there'll be social pressure or um, market pressure, if you will, that you know, people want to go to, say, restaurants uh, that are safe, where they feel safe, where they feel they won't be at risk. So, um, you know, so then, you know, vendors and some restaurant owners can can request that, uh, you know, patrons wear masks if at all possible, obviously not when you're eating, but, um, so there might be some social dynamic and some social pressure in there that will move people towards doing the right thing. By the way, I, I should add, there, there are places or situations in which the governor has directed it. Part of, part of phase one, when we get there, when barbershops, hair salons open up, there is a direct, you cannot open up, you cannot be open unless your employees are wearing masks. So there are certain situations, but I think Barbara is right. The, the hope is that there's a there's a sort of social contracts and social pressure to 
Yeah, and, and if I could just add, you know, I've heard from a number of people in the disability community, and I just want to share that perspective because there are some people that are very vulnerable and that if they get sick, then they, they yeah. could die. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that I understand the governor's position, but if we could give localities maybe the option to do more than just in strongly encouraging. Uh, I was out with my family uh, walking in, in a park in Arlington and most of the people were not wearing masks. And that's in Arlington. And, and you know, I think most of the people that we think are, are trying to do the right thing. But I, I, I did get sort of influenced by a lot of people in disabilities community. So I think that's a perspective that we need to take in consideration. People that live in high rise buildings, that if there's not a requirement, that if you're in an elevator with someone with a, with a disability, um, you know, it's, it's there, you're taking your life in your hands. Even if you don't leave your house, you're just taking the trash out. Uh, in those situations, uh, they become very vulnerable, and um, and it's very concerning. And I had a constituent who said that that she, uh, she went to the the Trader Joe's, and uh, and people weren't wearing masks. She had to leave, and uh, and you know that's not fair either. And so we just need to consider uh, those people that are most vulnerable, and they're being uh, prisoners in their own home because because people aren't doing the right thing. Uh, I I think we need to really emphasize that people, when they go out in public, uh, they need to wear masks, not just to protect themselves, but protect vulnerable people. I, I, I totally agree. And, uh, and I think that's an issue we have to raise because, um, you know, there's a whole enforcement question if it's not specifically in the governor's executive order. So, uh, so I, think, I think we need to raise that the next time we have a, a briefing with the governor and the governor's team. And I will say the localities can uh, make that requirement. We've looked into it. We get, we've gotten that question a lot. Is that so right? If localities are interested in yeah. requiring masks, they okay. can do that. And, All right. and they can enforce it? Um, yes, I think, it, and I'm not sure what legal way they can, but I, I know that they, that, that they can. And I can always get back to you on that. <laughs> I, I, think, I think we're going to have to get a little bit more information on that because our local leaders are going to want some assurances that they'll be able to enforce it. And uh, because if they can enforce it, they'll get the word out. Yeah. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll stick, you know, I think they, they share our values. Yeah, I, I know we're not just talking amongst ourselves. Megan, if, if you can get, uh, say something publicly about that, uh, it would be very helpful. I've been trying to get an answer. Uh, from from the governor's office for several days on this topic, and, and I haven't been able to. But you just said so, and so it might be helpful if if the governor said something or there's something issued to that effect. I know I know that that Arlington had been asked about it and, uh, right. as well too, so and, that would be extremely helpful. And I would like Secretary Moran to have a meeting with law enforcement on it. Yes, so I'll uh, circle back around with our council who um, looked into that situation as well as looking at enforcement. So I. We'll go back to you and you can share with your constituents. And speaking of the disability community, we have a question about absentee voting for the visually impaired. Can you comment on Im improvements to voting equipment um, to make it possible for blind and low vision voters to vote privately and independently at the polls on election day? Um, well, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I can't. I know there are provisions in, in place to allow uh, uh, visually impaired people to vote, um, just as there are provisions in place. There's curbside voting for people who can't get out of their car. Um, but I, I, the question is asking about improvements. I, I don't, I personally don't know of any, um, which is not to say they're not there. I just don't know about them. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I know that, that not, nothing in the law did we change this year to, to make that improvement other than I know that they're uh, buying some new programming for the software uh, that, 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 the, vote, that uh, the, the polls use. And I don't know if those upgrades can, can be helpful in any way, but it's something we should look into and, yeah. and, and get back to the questioner right. on because that is an important part. And, and yeah. who knows what's going to happen in November because this could also be the subject of a special session and allowing people uh, better access to voting absentee or mail-in, those options ought to be a consideration that will be beneficial for everyone. I think we should look into that. I'm certainly uh, 
depending on what the framework is for our special session, I'm certainly going to move forward, as I'm sure you gentlemen are too, with bills regarding uh, a mail-in voting option. And, and also with absentee voting to remove the, the witness uh, requirement. Only eight states in the entire country require a witness signature on an absentee ballot. So, so we have to, we certainly still have progress to make uh, on, on improving access to voting. We did have a record year this past session, which, you know, we removed the photo ID requirement. We have no excuse absentee voting, um, automated, uh, well, I, let me put it this way, automatic voter registration. If you go to DMV, you have to literally opt out to not have your information sent to the registrar now. So, so we've made lots of, um, and, and this is, these are just three of the major steps we took. There are actually 18 steps, but I'm not going to go through every little, um, you know, change we made to the election laws. So, um, so we're trying, we're going to get better, but this issue on folks with disabilities, I think is a really valid one. And, and maybe there's more going on than we know. Maybe registrars are doing more than I'm aware of in terms of uh, helping individuals who may be hearing impaired, sight impaired, or have other disabilities. So we'll, we'll get back to you on um, how we can improve. Barbara, you, know, you, you are right. We made a lot of progress on, on uh, access to the ballot box th this year, but that's only because there was so much progress that we needed to make. Okay. Virginia, has, Virginia has, has worked its way into a deep hole over the last yeah. generation um we're making it harder to vote I, I don't know if you all saw but the lawsuit was filed in in uh, i think in fairfax just today or maybe the day before yesterday um trying to declare unconstitutional the the decision that was made i think by the attorney general that um uh you can uh vote absentee in an election in the upcoming elections um checking the box that says whichever it is it's item six or whatever it is oh oh um, i thought it was my illness and disability they're looking to set they're looking to set that aside just to just to continue to make it hard to vote in virginia this is this is what we've been fighting for years my we God. still have a long way to go and whoever asked that question i think what you've heard is a consensus among the three of us here that we will take a look at it and we'll do everything we can to help visually impaired folks absolutely feel absolutely Anything we are else? almost done we probably have time for one more question and then we'll just con a quick conclusion. And uh, we do have a few questions that came in live. So I'm wondering if anybody here, any of the panelists wants to pick a random question that came in live. I can, I can ask you one of these questions or, you know, if something stood out to you, then please feel free to answer. Um, well, uh, one question has come up and we talked about it just prior to starting our official panel discussion. And that was um, how, how do you, uh, who do you contact to volunteer with, on the contact tracing um, effort? So, and I know- Or to apply for a job. Or to apply- Paying for job. job, right. You're right, you're right, because they are going to be paid jobs. Yes, absolutely. So I guess, Megan, did you want to respond to that? Sure. Um, so we are ramping up contact tracing. Uh, it is really important to when we open up businesses that we can identify anyone that's been affected or near somebody who might have COVID-19 to make sure that we can reach out to them and quarantine them or that box in that the, the governor talks about uh, to really slow down uh, the, the affections of COVID-19. And so for contact tracers, at the minimum, we're going to hire a thousand of contact tracers and 200 case investigators. And these contact tracers uh, will be like in a call center form, as well as some will be boots on the ground, uh, working with our communities, going to the door and having conversations. And so there's um, three different ways that someone can apply for the paid contact tracer positions. Uh, one is on the Virginia, um, Virginia Department of Health website. And we do all, any state agency, if you're looking for a job in state agency, it's jobs.virginia.gov and go to the Virginia Department of Health and you'll see contact tracers uh, there. Uh, we also have the job tracings on indeed.com, which many people look for jobs there. 
as well as many staffing agencies. We have 13, I think, that are now recruiting people, taking resumes and filtering them and sending them to the Department of Health. We are look, um, the hiring at the local level. And so you'd be working with that regional Virginia Department of Health. And then we have case investigators too. And this is someone who has a stronger medical background, um, especially anyone has master's in public health and they're kind of coordinate some of the, the case investigation. We're trying to hire 200 of those um, positions as well around the Commonwealth. Uh, if you're interested, but you already have a job, you also can do a contact tracing through the Medical Reserve Corps and that's vamrc.org. And um, that's where you can go and you apply uh, with medical background or not medical background. And I know that we have many volunteers, especially in Northern Virginia in the area that are do contact tracing. I think in Fairfax, we have a lot of the, the school nurses. Since schools are closed, they're actually in our call centers doing contact tracing. That, and they're perfect. So they have a medical background uh, to, to talk to the individuals um, and they're not in the school. And so we'll take anyone, paid or unpaid or volunteer, that a thousand is the minimum for contact tracers. It, it's definitely going to grow. We're going to need more and more tracers. Um, well, we've got, where are we on time? I have eight o'clock. Is that about right? It is. Okay. Um, well, I'll start. Delegate Hope, do you want to say a closing remark? And then. Yeah, I'll be glad to. And I have to drop off because I have another Zoom meeting to go to, which is nice because I don't have to travel. Uh, just Me too. I can go. Uh, but uh, thank you for, for hosting, uh, Senator Favola. I want to thank you, Megan, uh, Delegate Sullivan. It's always nice to share a, a virtual meeting with you. Uh, I know that these are unprecedented times. Please contact my office if, if I could be of any assistance uh, to you and your family. Uh, please, everyone, please follow the CDC guidelines. Uh, stay safe. Wash your hands as frequently as you can. Wear your masks in public and, and stay six feet uh, from, from each other. And we're going to get through this and we're going to come out on the other end much stronger. So thank you all for the opportunity to, to be here this evening. I hope everyone has a, has a great evening. What he said. It's, uh, uh, it, it, this, has been, this has been a lot of fun. Um, uh, Patrick, Barbara, Megan, always a pleasure to, to share the virtual stage with you. Um, I appreciate all the folks who, who made time in their evenings to, to sit in on this. Uh, we are all easy to find. You can get to me, uh, gripsullivan.com. Uh, we are spending an awful lot of time these days responding to constituent uh, questions and concerns, and we will do our very best to, to plug you in with uh, either Megan or, or all of our colleagues down in, in Richmond who are working 24-7 on trying to help folks through this, uh, through this crisis. Um, I hope to see you all in person sometime soon. Uh, I don't know what that means, but uh, just as absolutely as soon as possible. So. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Barbara, for putting this together. You're welcome. Thank you, Rick. I'll, I'll just say it's been a pleasure. Um, the questions were great. We uh, care very much about uh, all of you and your welfare. Um, and I know that, that most folks are trying very hard to follow the guidelines and the requirements that, that are necessary to, uh, to keep you safe and to keep each other safe. And I just think we now have evidence that social distancing and wearing your mask actually works. So if we know it works, we really do need to proceed and do it. And thank you also for continuing to check up on your neighbors. Many of you are volunteering, you're working at food banks, you're dropping uh, meals on wheels and I, that's great. And lastly, we all take our hats off to our uh, first responders, our healthcare providers, and those who are doing essential tasks for our day-to-day -day lives, our delivery personnel and people who are stocking the shelves in our grocery stores, we really appreciate you and, uh, and we wanna say thank you. All right, Great, folks. and I just wanna thank, thank everyone um, on this call. And, and if anyone has any questions about workplace safety or unemployment or workforce, um, please email my team, it's workforce at governor.virginia.gov and it's spelled out governor and Virginia spelled out. So it's workforce at governor.virginia.gov and we'll, we'll try to get your answers uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you everyone. You Thank did a you, great everyone. job. All right. Fun. Thanks everybody.
Thank you. We will connect soon, I hope. hope Bye-bye. So. Good night. Good night.